Hey everyone, this is Hercules Gomez, and you're watching Rave Green TV. Her first stuff we want to ask you are some quick fire questions, you know, just break the ice, you know, you know, so everyone can get to know you just a little bit more outside of your great punditry skills that most people may know you for, may not know you for, or maybe your plethora of amazing career that you had playing for various teams, the national teams, the national team. And so we'll first get started. Xbox or PlayStation? Xbox. Um, though all my friends growing up had PlayStations, but I was always more of an Xbox guy. So I'll stick to Xbox. Actually, when I was, this is supposed to be quick fire, so there's no stories involved, right? But but very quickly, when I, la last time I actually did play video games was in Seattle and Ozzy Alonso and I used to have like these amazing, just epic battles going on um, all the time. And if you guys know Ozzy, like he doesn't like to lose, but he's not like a guy you can banter with either. Like he, you know, he'll take the, like Ozzy's one of my greatest friends that I've made in, in, in football, like on a team, like my family gets along very well with his family. We always... We're in the same group together when I was in Seattle. But he's not a guy you, like you mess with. He's got this little streak in him. And when it came to FIFA, like we had some intense battles. And uh, I actually didn't know my sound bar um, picked up my sound. I just assumed I, I couldn't hear him. He couldn't hear me. So the whole time I'm talking shit to him and uh, he can hear everything. <laughs> yeah. Messi or Ronaldo? This is tough, but I'll, I'll go... Uh, it's very difficult not to just admire and respect everything that Messi's done in the game. Like uh, you have to say, if you're just picking one of who's better, it's Messi. But if I had to pick one, I would pick Cristiano just because it almost feels, and it's a disrespect to Messi saying this, that it's like God given. Um, that's that's what it feels like when you're watching. I'm like, this, this can't be real. This is abnormal. Um, but it doesn't feel that way with Cristiano. It feels like he's worked for everything he's ever had on the field and the fact that he started out as one player on the wing and he was just a 1v1 player and he was shifty and he kind of played for the crowd if, if you will um to turn into this just like lethal nine uh, the evolution's been been insane and, and I, I really respect that so um i would pick messi as a player cristiano um as work ethic favorite music artist there's a lot um but one of my favorite bands is Journey. Uh, my wife knows that I'm, I'm a Journey fan. And uh, for my uh, last birthday, not this one, it just passed um, a few weeks ago, but my last birthday last year, she took me to go see him here in LA. And, and that was pretty cool. It was a, she, she called, my wife's a little younger than I am. And she, she's like, oh, it's an old people band. And she was like really surprised at like the ages that came out. Not only ages, but just like crypto.com, which used to be the staples, just packed and sold out and it was a it was a awesome mbappe or holland mbappe um erling holland's a, a beast i don't think i've seen a, a forward like him since ronaldo just with with the pace and, and the ability and just the all he wants to do is score like that that's and i'm talking about il phenomeno i'm talking brazilian ronaldo but mbappe's just insane like if you think about it He's got two World Cup finals. He's got. He's gonna probably end up with more World Cup goals than anybody. And you can say whatever you want about the World Cup, and it's true. The Champions League is where the best football is played. But this guy's on a different level. Like I was in Qatar, and just you got to see him up close and personal. And you're just like, this, this, this guy is not natural. And there's there's something about the mentality. And you can say whatever you want. I know there's a lot of issues going on in PSG with him right now, but just. I don't know. I, I think he's something special, and it's very difficult to replicate. Toughest opponent you've ever gone up against? Thiago Silva. Brazil versus the U.S. men's national team in FedEx Field. 2012, 13, 12? We had him 1-1 at halftime. I scored the goal. Um, good little ball by, by uh, Michael Bradley to Fabian Johnson. Fabian Johnson hits it across. I, I, I scored off a header. But that's as good as it got. I mean, we, we got smashed the second half. It was like 4-1 final score. Actually, I should have had probably a second goal, maybe even a third. I, I played one of my best games for the national team. But I remember how difficult it was to play against Diago Silva because when he's not like all over you defensively, um, he's impossible to maintain in the sense that um, as a forward, like, yeah, the majority of your job is to score goals, but you also have to be like the first line of defense and, and trying to orientate him, like trying to make sure he goes one way to cut off a lane or a pass and him having the ability to completely switch the ball like 50 yards on a dime or play through you like a 30-yard 30 30 yard ball like through the heart of, of your team. 
and that being your fault like he was just so difficult and so intelligent and it was like a it was like a physical battle but like a mental chess match and like i may have scored the goal but he he absolutely got the better of us and then to close it all off dempsey or donovan uh clint dempsey absolutely um i i grew up kind of uh, playing with landon we played galaxy together national team together and landon by far is the player that always does what he's supposed to do like i can't recall a time you know we were strike partners at the galaxy we played together in national i can't recall a time where like even at practice where i'm thinking to myself god damn like he should have passed me the ball or he should have shot or he should have done this he's the one player in my life that i've played with that just always does what they're supposed to do and you're like that's that's a special talent but Clint was just different in the worst of ways different and in the best of ways, you know, and he, he's a guy that would shoot even if you were open. He's a guy that took chances. He, he's got this like chip on his shoulder. He's got this mentality to him. He's, he's a winner. Um, and he had this, you know, ability to get out of things when he had nothing to, to do there. Like when you couldn't or shouldn't get out of something, he could get out of something and he can create something out of nothing. And there are a few players that I've played with with that ability, but he could do it with his right foot. He could do it with his left foot. He could do it on the dribble. He could do it combining. He could assist. He could do it off a set piece. He could do it with his head. He could do it as a nine. He could do it underneath the nine, out in the wing. Like he was just different. Like he was, like if I had to win a game today, um, that's the guy I'd go to. Like he's the guy that I'd want on my team. Uh, so I, I'd have to say Clint. Now that we've, uh, We've got all those questions out of the way. Let's now let's now transition to talking about your career a little bit with the Sounders. I mean, what was it like playing for the Sounders? You were part of the team back in 2016. And, you know, a lot of people always ask, what makes the Sounders? I mean, they were named, I think it was in 2020, they were named the best MLS club of the decade. What makes this team so successful? What sets this team apart from every other MLS team? So this it's two parts to this question. What makes them so successful um, is the standard to which, you know, they hold themselves on and off the field. The front office, um, the players, the staff, like that standard is what makes them so successful. There's actual there's an actual culture um, within the Seattle Sounders and something that most clubs don't have or, or wish they have. Um, or could have the sounders have culture um that's what makes them so su su successful is that standard that they have what makes them different is we're in a landscape where history is scarce you know it's it's it's, it's or scarce excuse me it's it's a it's not something that you see a lot of i mean leagues going on 30 years um that's the history you know there's clubs around the world that are over a hundred years. You know, I played for a few clubs in Mexico that, that could say that. Um, the Seattle Sounders have history. The Seattle Sounders have an actual history. They have actual alumni. They got players. They got community built in. They, they've been part of Seattle since since the seventies. Like there's there's an actual part of them that's part of the fabric of, of Seattle of the city. Um, that sets them apart. That puts them in a whole different ball game for majority of clubs in the continental you know united states that's that's a difference between them that standard is is what makes them successful but that history um, and them being so tied into community is what sets them apart i guess my case was was different than most because i had actually had history with the seattle sounders i'd went on loan when i was in 2003 from the la galaxy and i was a uh, 19 turning 20 broke my foot like the third day in Yakima, we were playing some some scrimmage game in Yakima, and I remember breaking my fifth metatarsal, and that was pretty much it for me. Um, you know, here and there, I had a few games with Seattle when I was trying to come back, but back to the Galaxy, I went. And then my, I guess, stints with Seattle was against them. I used to play the CONCACAF Nations, or excuse me, CONCACAF Champions League uh, versus the Seattle Sounders when I played in with santos and we'd meet each other in the quarterfinals semifinals and we had some some intense battles and i i remember not only was i fortunate enough to get the best of them but i i did very well against the seattle sounders and there was banter there was like a rapport with the fans and, and i built that rapport with the fans um, online in social through jabs uh with the press uh, siggy schmidt was was my ex-coach and you know the late siggy schmidt uh, may you rest in peace with my late coach of the la galaxy and we had had kind of our issues with the Galaxy, and, and by the time I came back to playing against them, they had been resolved and built up a good 
you know, uh, communication with him and good relationship. And it just happened that, you know, that maintained that good, those good vibes were maintained the fan base with the front office, Adrian, you know, Hanauer, um, with Siggy Schmidt. And when the opportunity came uh, to play with Seattle, it was a no brainer for me. In fact, um, it was my, I knew, I knew it would probably be my last season as a professional. And I had this situation with Toronto. Um, and my agent at the time asked me, is there anywhere you would like to see if you can go? And I said, Seattle. And he goes, that's funny you say that. And I said, why? And he's like, Seattle actually reached out. And it ended up being kind of like a perfect fit. They wanted to see me because I was like 34 years old uh, and coming off of uh, you know some knee surgeries in my career. They wanted to see what I had left in the tank. So I had like a, a trial with the Seattle Sounders. And in this trial was me and this like... Um, kid that played on the left-hand side named Nahu Tolu and you know we we played in this little trial game together and you know whipped in a good ball and I finished it off with my head and you know I, I that was like 30 minutes in and they pulled me out and they're like all right you're good to go and that was it you know uh, that was and it ended up being a situation where um, you know uh, it was a very fun year um, Seattle I was part of Seattle winning the very first ever uh, MLS Cup um, and, and just being part of a team with so much history and being part of that standard um, was, was fun for me. You know, I, had, I have fond memories of Seattle. Yeah, so now I guess the biggest thing Sounders fans are, are currently talking about is the striker position because that's kind of, it was kind of, I think, a little bit of a question of concern going into this season. But now in a good way, it's kind of, there's question marks surrounding this position. The Sounders signed Eber. They brought him in uh, because uh, Rui Diaz was hurt. Morris is playing on the left-hand side. And so when Eber started, he got goals in back-to-back games. Awesome. He seems like a perfect fit for the team. Then he gets injured, and Raul's still not really back to full fitness. So then Brian Schmetzer brings in an old striker player, a player that used to play striker when you were playing for the Sounders back in 2016, and Jordan Morris. And then obviously now he's banging in a, a whole crap ton of goals. But obviously now Raul's back healthy, Eber's back healthy, Morris is scoring goals. What I want to ask you is what does each one of these guys bring in that striker position? And if everyone was 100% healthy, who would you be playing in, in these games now? Like what, like, cause it's kind of a head scratcher. Do we keep playing Morris? Do we play Raul? Because we know Raul's going to score like Raul's like his pedigree speaks for itself. And then Eber actually had a, two really good games that I think he played well and actually made the team look really good. Not to say Morris doesn't either, but I feel like Eber really fit the system really well but which what did each one of these strikers bring to the table for this team and if i mean in your opinion what should the sounders do in this situation they're all kind of different in their own way right maybe ever and um raul Rui diaz are, are the closest in, in profile um ever is coming off of uh, a knee surgery in i believe 2020 19 20 around there um 2020 because 2019 he actually banged in a bunch of goals he was like uh one of the golden boot candidates uh with new york city fc a a team that played a very attractive brand you know very proactive in the final third a lot of possession based uh, not so much in transition because i think the sounders are more of a transition team at times uh, a player like him would probably be like a will bruin kind of role um what will bruin did the you know the last two um, years for the Seattle Sounders, more off the bench, more being that wily veteran, more providing some depth, uh, things like that. Raul, out of all three, is probably the most talented one in terms of just pure out and out goal scorer. And he's proved it throughout his career. I mean, you know, multiple golden boots in, in, in Liga Mekis, uh, Peruvian national team. Big time player for the Seattle Sounders when it comes to knockout competitions. Like his goal scoring record speaks for itself. But he's not been healthy as of late. And and listen, Father Time is undefeated. Um, it happens to every single player. It doesn't matter how talented you are. At some point, your body starts breaking down. And, and and if you can get the best out of him, he's he's on the field. But it's can you get the best out of him at a consistent rate where you trust it, where you trust him, where he trusts his body? Because I know he's had his own issues um, of trusting his body. You know, I spoke to him at MLS Media Day and asked him, excuse me, MLS Media Day and asked him how he felt. And he's, you know, it's getting there. That's that's what it was. He was getting there. So it's it, it, it's a process. Um, but at some point, you got to just go with the hot hand. 
especially when it comes to goal scores. And Jordan Morris is very much that. And Jordan Morris is an interesting character in this landscape because he gets such a bad rap. There's a sector of fans who want nothing to do with Jordan Morris and players like Jordan Morris because for the U.S. Men's National Team because he's you know MLS because of everything that they presume he is. But Jordan's a guy when he's played the forward position, whether nine or second striker, he scored goals. And he's a guy that many coaches have trusted. Siggy Schmidt trusted him. Brian Schmesser trusted him at the club level. Um, the Seattle Sanders trust him enough uh, where, where they've given him a massive contract. Um, Jurgen Klinsmann trusted him as a college player on the national team. Jurgen Klinsmann leaves. Bruce Arena, who's the all-time winningest coach in Major League Soccer and one of the I mean, and probably if you want to go just off achievements, the best coach uh, in U.S. Men's National Team history. That's not, I don't think, debatable. He got to got to a quarterfinal game versus Germany and a blown handball away from being in a semifinal in the World Cup and everything he's won. Um, and then it's Greg Berhalter, and, and now it's Anthony Hudson. So so they keep putting up these but, 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 all these like, but it's this way, but it's because of this for Jordan Morris, and he kind of keeps out and doing, oh, and by the way, Throughout everything, he's had massive injuries. I've been through ACL tears. They're not easy. And after every time he has an ACL tear, every, every time he has a setback, he comes back stronger. Uh, Verda Bremen wanted to take a chance on him. Swansea did take a chance on him. I, I think it's about time the Sounders took a chance on him at that position as well. You know, let it let it ride with them. He's having a, a banner year. Um, and I know he's... And that, getting up there in age, he's like not even 28 yet. You know, I think he's like maybe 20, 27, turning 28, something like that. But he has the ability to be a player that can score many goals for you in Major League Soccer. He has the ability to be a game changer for you. So this is the problem with the Seattle Sounders is, is they've got a lot of pieces right now that I don't necessarily think can make the correct puzzle because – if I had it my way, I'd probably say, well, I would play Raul Ruiz Diaz and, and Jordan Morris together up top, and I'd go to a line of three. But then you're like, I'm not taking Christian Roldan out. You know, he, he's been a massive player for Seattle, and he's kind of like that, the Brad Evans of his er of his era, you know, the guy you can plug in anywhere. Rushnak, am I, am I taking him out? Because I'm not taking Joao Paulo out. So where do I put Rushnak? Is it Lodero? Is it Nico Lodero who's like the, the sacrificial lamb there? Like, what do you do there? So there's 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 things right now that don't necessarily fit. Um, and that's something that Brian Schmetzer and Craig Weibel uh, need to figure out going forward is, is how do we get the correct puzzles here? Because you can have depth and depth is great, but depth isn't always great at the risk of losing that culture, you know, of of. of of maybe disrupting that rhythm. So now, it, actually, this segues really well. It leads me to ask you, because you've talked about a little bit of Rui Diaz now having, it's it seems like his, you know, time is, it's catching up to him a little bit. We're seeing injuries on a consistent basis. Do you maybe think about if you want to switch formations up, bring the best out of every player? Does maybe Ladero get dropped? Does Rusnak get dropped? And the two players I want to talk about who are on designated player contracts, Rusnak is, but he's not going to be the topic at hand, is Rui Diaz and is Ladero? I think there's kind of a little bit of a split within fans where uh, the past three seasons we've seen Rui Diaz have kind of constant injuries, like for period periods of time throughout the season. And Ladero, pretty much outside of last season, was struggling really badly with injury. I think through 2020 and 2021, and uh, with with the likes of Morris doing really well, Rusnak is a new designated player and is younger than the both of them with Eber also joining the club and is doing really well and is doing their job, do you think maybe it's time to let go of one of the one of the two or, or maybe both of them? Uh, because you see the likes of uh, Darusi, Vela, Mukhtar, they're putting up crazy numbers. And when you look at, La look at Ladero, uh, not to say that, obviously in other metrics, outside of goals and assists, he's leading the league. I don't know specifically, I don't have him off the top of my head. But in regards to, I guess, w what really matters is the goals and an assist. Um, and he just doesn't have that no those numbers anymore. Do you think maybe the Sounders should look into getting rid of one of the two or both of them to maybe find someone else in the designated player spot? Or no, that would be silly to 
even consider? I think Nico is a very intelligent individual and he understands that this will probably be his last year as a DP. I think he's, he's aware of that. I think he's a very self-aware individual. He's a very smart guy. Um, what I think that the Seattle Sounders have an advantage over every other club is they treat their players a certain way. The standard isn't just with how you perform on the field. It's how they treat their players. Um, I would love for players. This would have been great for Ozzy Alonso to still be within the club. Um, Ozzy had his own aspirations. You have to respect that. And so did the Seattle Sounders. But at some point, there needs to be a, we need to bring him back into the club. The Christian Roldans need to be graduated into front office at some point, you know, later on. Nico Lodeiro, the same thing. That's what the biggest clubs in the world do, is they hold on to their players. Um, they're there for life. Doesn't necessarily mean Nico Lodeiro is going to play at a high level next year at a DP salary. But there is a place for Nico Lodeiro, and I think he understands that. Right now, you mentioned Carlos Vela. They had to wait for two years for Carlos Vela. I mean, what Nico, what Rui Diaz is going through right now, Carlos Vela went through for the last two years before last season. I mean, he was injured. He didn't. He had, I believe, a total of nine, ten goals in two seasons. Um, and you can see how they wrote it out, and he's one of the best players in North America today, just talent level. Nico's a different type of player. He, he's he's a player who I think can still provide, and you saw it in the CONCACAF Champions League. He's a big time player. Last season, uh, Major League Soccer, I believe he had like seven goals, seven assists. It wasn't like his best season. So in big games, these players have responded for you. There's something to be said for that. Now, I understand fans, they wanna win, right? Fans wanna, we, we wanna continue winning type of deal. Um, that's where it gets tricky. If it's dropping Lodero, if it's uh, moving Ruznak, that's something that Brian Schmetzer should absolutely uh, look into. But if we're talking about dropping him from the team, I don't think that's a situation I would do with Nicolas Lodero. If we're talking about dropping him from a lineup, I think Nico's, you know, he's 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 no dummy. He realizes he's got to perform to stay on the field. Role is interesting because uh, goal scores are are measured by one thing, and that's goals. And you can't score goals if you can't stay on the field or get on the field. So it's it's proven his health. And and until he does that, until he proves he's he's healthy, and it's not to, to us, it's just to the coaching staff, to his teammates, and to, to himself, until he trusts, there's a trust there, built there, you've got to keep going with Jordan Morris. I don't know how you move that. Uh, that the, the disruption of moving something like that right now could be detrimental to the team to your to your efforts um the seattle sounders have a have a certain fear factor right now with jordan morris uh in that position i wouldn't move it you know and i i think any player knows that you know their actions will will get them on the field but also keep them on the field i don't think anybody can say anything i don't think raul could could be upset if he's behind a player who's just scoring goals I mean, it doesn't matter who you are the biggest player on the team or the youngest player on the team that's just the law of the game. Let's say this is a little bit of a theoretical game. Let's say Morris hits 20 some goals and Eber hits 10 plus goals. Do you think maybe then Seattle should be like, well, these guys are kind of doing it. Do we maybe think Raul even and, and let's say he even has his big games, but like he's on a designated player contract. And in, in my opinion, when you compare DPs across the league, I think the Sounders three DPs are in various ways, uh, maybe not putting up the big numbers like the other ones. They're, they ha they've are they been having a lot of injury issues, and one of them doesn't really play in his natural position of attacking mid. So it's kind of like, it's a little all over the place right now with them. W what's going to give here with, with, this designated, with this designated player issue, in my opinion? Because I think there is a little bit with fans, uh, with how th these players are being lined up, but they're not necessarily always producing, or they're always injured, and... Maybe we should just look for something different. Let me just say in your scenario, um, if Jordan Morris were to hit 20 something goals, you'd have a bigger problem because now you'd have another DP on your hands. There's no way Jordan Morris sticks around a as any player besides a DP player, um, which may be the case right now. I had a conversation with, with Christian Roldan and MLS Media Day and, and he's a player that could command a, a good amount of money with the Seattle Sounders. And, and he, he took a... He took a, I don't want to say pay cut, but he was very well aware of his salary demands and how they could impact the ability to sign other players. 
and he made a special case of Jordan Morris, of noting Jordan Morris. So I don't know what that situation is there. I'd be very interested once the MLS salaries come out this summer to see what Jordan Morris is at um, and what the that scale or triggers could be. But I'm willing to bet that if he's not going to be a DP, with certain metrics, he will be a DP. Um, so if Jordan Morris scores 20-something goals for the Seattle Sounders, the Seattle Sounders are in trouble as a front office because then they got some real problems. I mean, it's great for the field. It's great what you have on the field and the product, but now you're going to have some real problems and real decisions to make. And listen, every team goes through a rebuild. Every player realizes they're not the same player that they were once before. Um, it happens to the best of us. You know, I, I went back to Major League Soccer knowing that I'd taken like an 80% pay cut. Um, that's 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 just the reality of the game. Nothing lasts forever. But certainly those are interesting decisions because there are players you'd like to hold on to. There are players that help with the culture, help with the building process. And players like Nicolás Lodeiro, players like Raúl Ruiz Díaz, they just don't grow on trees. You know, there, There's something to be said about that side of the culture. So it, it's a lot of questions uh, that need to be answered. But um, if ever... 31 Raul's 32 you know Jordan Morris isn't even into his 30s yet so if, there, if that scenario you planted happens uh, I think the biggest problem will be what do you do with Jordan Morris as a DP and ever I mean I, I don't think there's any risk of keeping him on like you would a Will Bruin or you have a Will Bruin and Raul that's the enigma because it, I don't I don't think it's even goal scoring for Raul it's health it's you got to see that he's healthy and if he's healthy, you, you've got to assume that within the right group, within the right circumstances, he's going to score goals for you. So the final thing I want to ask you, because you are on a fan channel, is your thoughts on fan channels and MLS. So in, Euro, in European football, more specifically the Premier League, almost every single club has a, a fan channel. And it's begun to grow now in MLS. Like, for example, there's We Are Austin TV, who, big shout out to them. Uh, on one of your shows, I believe it's called Football America, you guys used some of their clips from their fan reactions, which was awesome to see. And obviously there's like Atlanta United Fan TV, Charlotte Fan TV, and there's there's a plethora more. I just can't think off the top of my head. What are your thoughts on like that kind of those kind of pages, the content creation within MLS and in the league? Yeah. So on ESPN Plus, I host a show called Football Americas, um, and we put up some uh, Austin TV stuff. Uh, they're great. They do a great job of covering the team. They do a great job of putting their brand uh, onto the coverage. And what I mean by that is uh, I consider myself like new media. Like if you've ever seen like JJ Redick do basketball, like that's what I think I do for soccer. JJ Redick, check it out. Like it's, it's, he's not your traditional mainstream media. Like we work, I work at ESPN and I, I have a traditional role at ESPN, but I'm very much of the mindset of I cover the sport differently. I cover MLS differently. You know, um, I cover the players differently. Uh, even my interactions with fan channels, they're different. Like I, I don't look down at them. I think they're part and they're very valuable uh, because sometimes they're the ones who are now like the new age beat reporters. Like you guys are in, in a way like the new age beat reporter. That's what it is. So I love it. I love it. I'm part of this new media. I dig it. Um, I love the passion that the fan brings to the channel i love the perspective um and the entertainment because i think that's been something that you know in mainstream media has been missing excuse me for for a long time is that entertainment factor so uh, i i get a, a good kick out of seeing a few things um from certain channels like you know what to expect with their brand and it's it's entertaining so i love it man uh, i think it's great that's that's how a lot of the people you see today started they were fans you know and they, they started doing this because they were fans and it grew into something it grew into them having a microphone and a platform and then somebody watching them or seeing them and then being being given an opportunity and it's awesome so i dig it